Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Good to be back. I mean, yeah, man. So before this, you and I were both talking about we are in uh, quarantine and lockdown over here. And uh, I was uh, fuck. I was a couple of days ago out. So I don't live in a full house. I live in a townhouse complex. Um, and so I don't have a backyard. And uh, I went to a park near me to do push ups. And even though a cop didn't stop me, a cop drove by and gave me like that look, you know, mm. but no one's around me. Like I'm in a park. There's no human mm. being, maybe 600 meters even fucking near yeah. me. And I'm yeah. just doing my push ups. And like that cop came and look, I'm like, what is this? Like, am I like, what the, what the fuck have we come up? Like, what, what's going on? It's not different to what East Germany was like, isn't it? You see, because there's just there's there's the physical, oh, you're not allowed to do this and that, but then there's that in the back of your mind, there's something that you live with, um, where you're not you feel like you're not sure, you're not free to do um things that you'd considered to be perfectly normal and and within reason beforehand. And this can happen in many things. You know, I grew up in Africa. When I was young, it was a relatively safe place to be increasingly it became an, a pretty unsafe place to be and what happens is you 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 change your behavior accordingly so like and i used to train for triathlons and i'd go mm. out um and i would bike um to a swimming pool and i'd train and do about two k's in the pool and i'd bike home i'd get home drop the bike and then i'd go for a run and get back and all of this I, it would take me quite a while and so i'd be doing a lot of it in the dark and that was kind of my training route you know, routine on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. And and then that changed because you're out dark and you're like you're running and you 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 know you just know that on a probability scale you're gonna get um, mugged at some point. And so then you change your routes that you run. And you try and make sure that you're within suburbs and in the lights and all those sorts of things. And and then to the point where you go, oh, I'm not gonna <clears throat> because. I had a buddy I used to train with, and he went out and he got um, he was on his bike, and they got um, he got mugged, and his bike got stolen, and <laughs> I just hit him on the head, and he was a far, he was right in the end. But but then I was like, okay, well, you know, so you start changing your behavior, and then I would only bike on the weekends, you know, mm -hmm. when it was light, and then I wouldn't run at night, and I'd I'd real, I'd go and do sprints in the back garden instead of running, you know, I used to do like a five k route, and you know, and it's the same thing you're talking about now, where you you're you know, you you start changing your behavior because you you feel that that discomfort, um, and a lot of it has got, you know, it's got very little to do with any any logical reality. You know, the fact that you're in a park and there's nobody around you. Look, firstly, the virus has been proven, and this is true of any virus. And again, I'm not a you know I'm not a professionalist, but I've read enough to of professionals work um to ascertain that this is true and um one of the best things that you can do is fresh air and sunshine <laughs> yeah. imagine. imagine i mean that's why on cruise ships and things like that, that you're in a confined space it spreads it's hospitals are the worst place for it it's like a little uh, a petri dish of virus yep whereas if you're outside <clears throat> it's much much Firstly, it's more difficult to transmit a virus when you're out in the open door, open air. Secondly, it actually helps to kill the virus yep. because it doesn't like fresh air and sunlight. And what they're doing is they're telling people not to be out in the fresh air and sunlight. I mean, there's videos of people being arrested for sunbathing yeah. in the park. It's absurd. It's like what you should be doing is telling people to get outside and go and mm -hmm. sunbathe in the fucking park because that's probably the best thing to actually um you know stop the transmission but but that doesn't um and look even even if that um wasn't the case the the absolute hysteria around this um and, and i'll and i'm sure people will be listening to this going oh no you guys have got it wrong and the professionals have told us this is a pandemic and we must you know all do our part and all and to that i would say look at the numbers and put it into context because um without context you are absolutely being hoodwinked yeah this, I, this, I use this a skin is, in the game uh filter when i talk about experts i'm mm -hmm. like what do they have to gain what do they have to lose they have nothing to lose Fuck off you know there's you'll constantly see it 
and it's um, oh, we're all in this together. Really? Are we? Are we really? <laughs> because because the politics like in in the last month or two, depending on the country that you're in, there has been a decimation of small medium business and private livelihoods, individual livelihoods on a scale that we've not yet seen um, and it's exceeded the 2008 crisis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the private sector, the, the, the value destruction has been enormous. You show me where in the public sector they've matched that step by step, right? So if there's a 10% reduction in, in um, and um, foreclosures or not foreclosures, uh, bankruptcies in the private sector, we should have a 10% reduction in the government workforce. Mm -hmm. in, in, but that's not happening. These guys are all still getting their salaries. They're sitting at home getting their salaries. So they're not in this together. They're absolutely not in this together. And in many instances, they're the ones who are still free to travel. Yeah. Over here, uh, they're telling everybody, don't even go see your own uh, um, family. And so Trudeau was talking about our prime minister. But yeah, he went to go see his own family at his own private fucking cottage. Yeah. Bravo, really bravo. Rules for some and, and not rules for the others. And if you and I do that, we get arrested. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, cr it's crazy, man. But the good news is I think a lot of people... A lot of people are pissed off and a lot of people aren't seeing uh, are seeing right through the bullshit. And I think we're going to have I think there's going to be a big unrest, man, in the next couple of years. I think people are just completely fed up. And if things don't change and if things don't get better and if markets don't open up and markets become if markets don't become more free market because we're not in a free market. You have five stocks that have 80 percent of the market cap. They're just literally there's no pumping. Free market. There's no free market. I mean, when the government dictates who survives and who doesn't. And that's what they're mm -hmm. doing right now. If you're mm -hmm. considered essential, you survive. And if mm -hmm. you're not, you have to just make it up and 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 nut it out. And that's um, that's the reality. So so and while it, and so you have a lot of companies that are scrambling to try and, and meet the new protocols, whatever those might be. It's different for you guys in Canada, but you know, if you like so restaurants for example here are not allowed to be opened the only thing that are allowed to be open are supermarkets same here um, yeah. and if they drop to the next level um, which they're considering doing in another week's time then basically it's takeouts which i'm like fuck you know it's like oh you're opening up kfc fuck off like i, I don't even eat you need, you need to open business but regardless of that um you'll have Restaurants that are now just doing takeout, right? Because they can actually fit into that the protocols, and they can prove that they are doing, you know, social distancing and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, so you have a lot of these businesses that are retrofitting, they're changing, they're trying to do do what is, and they're working with metrics that you, you they don't know how long those are going to last for, you know. So if you're a company, if you're a restaurant, you go, okay, do we retrofit to some extent? Maybe it'll cost us a few thousand bucks. Um, but what if they change that, right? Yeah. Because it's literally on the fly, they're making these decisions. And then what if they only do it for a week? Is it worth us expending that amount of capital where we're only gonna get a week and we don't know what the demand's gonna look like in that week that we that we can reopen on, the, on that contingency? So you've got this extraordinary uncertainty in, um, in, in and this is not a markets thing. This is not stock market, this is the economy. This is the real economy where people are being forced to make um, extremely difficult decisions under um, an environment where they simply can't see into that future in any real with any real clarity. And um, and what it's doing, and this comes into the markets, is that it's it's collapsing supply yeah. of many things. Um, and so we just we just took on a client um, a couple of weeks ago for for our, um, our managed funds business, and it was extraordinary. He's based out in um, in the states, runs a hospital, and you know what they're doing there? They've they've, they've closed down 
the hospital, um, all elective surgery, and elective surgery is where they make um, all their profits, where hospitals literally manage to actually make their profits, and, um, and all the other stuff is kind of tangential somewhat. Anyway, so they had to shut down all of that um, for the coronavirus. Um, subsequently, they're all sitting around twiddling their thumbs. The hospital is pretty much empty. They've got a few patients, but it's not, you know, it's not really a big deal. Um, but many businesses or many hospitals like them are actually going bust. They've got a month or two before they have to close shop. And there are nurses now that are <laughs> that have lost their jobs that are standing in the bread lines. So we have this, this, oh, we need all the nurses, we need all of the doctors, we need all the hospitals ramped up, this narrative. And yet the hospitals are empty and the nurses are joining the, the bread lines because they've got no employment. Mm -hmm. it's extraordinary it's absolutely extraordinary but what you're seeing is a collapse of supply of, of many of these things in the food sector and it's one that we've been spending a lot of time analyzing over the last um last few months and you and i spoke about this uh, after the last podcast we did and um, when we were offline we were talking about um solar cycles yeah um which comes into the whole agricultural space and it's one that i think people need to pay attention to but Stepping aside from the from that element of it, if you're a farmer and you're supplying anybody that's not a a supermarket, that's not de deemed essential, you don't have you don't have a market anymore. So we've got farmers that are plowing their their produce back into the land, mm -hmm. that are pouring milk down the drain, that are digging massive pits and chucking all of their onions or their potatoes and all this back into the ground. Um, extraordinary destruction of value. Extraordinary. Simply, and, and look, what this actually amounts to is the same situation that we had with the USSR. The Bolsheviks, yeah. The Bolsheviks. You know, where, where they dictate who survives, who doesn't survive, how much of any particular thing should be um, uh, produced and in what quantities and to whom. That's, Bolsh that's the Bolsheviks. And that's, a, that's what we suddenly find ourselves with today. The governments to are there, deemed um, the purveyors of um, critical um, judgment, and they deem what is essential and what's not essential. And so we've now, I mean, you're going to the supermarkets and you're seeing a lack of supply because there's not enough flour. There's not, and you could say, well, hang on a second. We used to have enough, like what, what's changed? And what's changed is that the there's been a, a certain percentage of society that quite simply don't eat at supermarkets, right? They eat at restaurants and hotels and cafes and other food outlets um, and they're no longer eating there. So now you have an increased demand in the supermarket side of the chain um, and all of that other side that was producing food has just been destroyed. So those mm -hmm. businesses are now um, impaired and or in some instances going bust. There's farmers now going bust. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you've got this extraordinary setup of, of supply demand imbalance and then this is the you know this is the the real kicker while while because <laughs> you have your average joe who goes to the supermarket and goes okay i gotta buy all these goods but i'll the business that i'm running i can't run at the moment right because i'm a plumber or i'm a carpenter or i'm a carpet layer or whatever the hell it is but i'm not an essential service and as a consequence my business is now impaired or i or i lost my job or i don't have or i've been put on um unpaid leave or whatever the case mm -hmm. might be and i help and i haven't got sufficient income cool the government's going to pay me so now you've got an increase in the supply of money and you have n like money and this is what people don't understand money is simply a representation of productivity so if you increase the unit 
and you don't increase the denominator of the actual productivity, the, the, you have a mismatch and that mismatch is just inflation. Yeah. And so we're setting ourselves up for an extraordinary belting of inflation in specific goods. So I don't anticipate we'd have inflation in some things, um, but consumer goods, foodstuffs, um, absolutely. You know, again, I come back to what we we're talking about at the start. We just look at the numbers, you know, um, this whole narrative around the coronavirus. You look at the numbers, you go, how many people does it actually kill? Um, what and in and in what context? Um, as we're saying, you know, heart disease kills 17 million people a year. We don't stop the world economy because because of that. Um, this coronavirus. Look, if this thing killed 17 million, that would be devastating. Mm -hmm. It would be huge, but it would be on a par with heart disease currently on an annual basis that we all live with and we just get on with our lives. I'm not trying to be callous here, but, you know, there's, there is a real price to pay for shutting down people's lives and, and destroying the world economy. It's going to be massive, and guys. You can't you see until later, until it's too late. Well, people understand if we look at Maslow hierarchy of needs, right, the pyramid, the bottom layer, food, shelter, those are the first thing that's going to hit when it comes to inflation. People think things are expensive now, just wait. Number two, things that they can see then right away, because that's a boiling frog. Bit by bit, prices rise. It's not like, let's say, beef is four ninety nine a pound. It's not tomorrow nine ninety nine a pound. It's going to then be five twenty two a pound, then five forty five a pound, and six and slowly. Next thing you know, it's nine ninety nine pound. Like how the fuck did we get here? Yeah. And the thing though, the people will quickly realize. So let's talk about M money supply. So increase of money. It's just very simple supply and demand economics. So you increase the supply of money within the economy. The government needs to control whatever Fed, Treasury, they need to control the velocity of that money. <laughs> okay, what's one of the easiest ways to reduce the supply of money in the economy? Tax people more. Mm -hmm. Literally, tax people more. Mm -hmm. So people are like, they're uh, they're waiting for these handouts, and these handouts will stay here for indefinitely. I don't see the government or any politician, they're going to use this as a talking point and use this as a selling point to get votes. I this is this is gonna this is gonna introduce in its twisted way some weird form of ubi uh it's gonna keep on going and uh, what people really don't realize is fast forward a year and a half two years later all their taxes is up their <clears throat> uh their sales tax is up their property tax is up their income tax is up everything's going to be up and so we're heading into a very bad period but my question to you chris is as a professional investor and you've been doing this forever and not just investor as an entrepreneur as well so those are two different hats right a builder yeah. and investor um where what what are you focusing on you mentioned food supply right now and uh, you mentioned you're working with the hospital but in these very i want let's call them turmoil times what 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 do you see the opportunity right now it's funny it's the you know it's all the stuff that we had been focused on before the the coronavirus um yeah you're still there yeah sorry the the screen just froze i wasn't oh. sure if it was oh there we go um yeah so we've we've we identified a number of sectors that were before the coronavirus that were um opportunistic to us and presented asymmetry we're interested we're not interested really in where the dow's going or the s p or the NASDAQ or anything of that nature, we, we deep dive into um, deep value situations and then we overlay that with a macro um, economic worldview and where the two intersect is where we get comfortable in investing. And so with that as a premise to start with the deep, deep value sectors that existed before this um, were quite ironically the very, um, the very sectors that that um, we believe now have an even greater and, and much greater than I could have ever anticipated um, tailwind behind them. And it comes back to what you mentioned before, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so within that space, um, the things that we have been focused on have been um, largely sectors that have been in a bear market for um, 
often a decade. Um, they are things that are critical to humanity or critical to civilization. Um, they're the bedrock of um, production. So if you look at um, food, we were talking about food. Now, if you, if you go through the value chain of food, which actually, if you were going to boil it down to, at least in the modern world, we'll boil it down to one thing and one play, if you try to encapsulate the entire space, it'll be energy. Mm. Uh, whether it be running your tractor, whether it be yeah, um, the production of phosphates, fertilizers, um, whether it be the transportation of foodstuffs, there's one critical key component behind all of them. And if you go back and you, you study, and we've done this, you study um, cycles of agriculture and the cycles of energy. Um, if you want, if you wanted to synthetically be long agriculture, you would um, you would be looking at the energy sector. What I think is possibly different this time around um, is something else which we've we've mentioned a lot before, and we've spent a lot of time analysing is the entire geopolitical world and what we're going through now. And this is going to exacerbate it is a deglobalization. Yeah. So. Um, so as you deglobalize, essentially economies and markets become more localized, and and that localization also is um, it means that energy becomes localized. Um, that also ties in with that globalization. We we anticipated and and we're now getting it um, already coming through is nationalization of particular resources. Um, when you go down the nationalization of resources and any sort of, hey, what's really important to us? Um, certainly at the top, tippy top of that pyramid is, is energy. You, you never have political security without energy security. It just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so you go back through um, any society that has always been critical that the government or the that country and their political structure have um, in some shape or form energy security, whether it be an alliance with a neighbor, whether it be whatever, it, it's it's always critical to them um, functioning and, re and retaining power. So, so back to the whole ag space, if you look at energy on a localized basis, um, that's, I think that's going to, that's going to be a fundamental shift that um, is really going to wake people up. Um, and so there is no one um, energy that you would say, oh, it's, it's oil or it's natural gas. It's going to be specific to specific countries. And you're going to have this, this, this change. We're already seeing that. Um, and, and, you know, I give the example of Japan, where Japan, which is known to be energy dependent and always has been. That's one of the, the Achilles heels, if you yep. will. Um, when, so, so you know, post Bretton Woods, Japan, Japan's ally was the United States um, when they came into that vortex, if you will, of, um, of the US hegemony. And that allowed them a certain level of security because um, the energy supplies come through the Strait of Hormuz that is all patrolled by the US Navy, they are friendly to the US, and so they had this energy security that existed. Um, now they can see that the US is pulling back from that role, and they're going, well, we've got to, we have to do something, you know, we have to secure our own, our own future, um, because they have, you know, neighbors that don't particularly like them, South Korea are not particularly friendly, you know, there's long, long, deep-seated hatred there, back to World War II, same thing with China. And so it's not a surprise that um, that they are building 78 coal-fired power stations. And the reason behind that is because Japan is this world's um, second largest Navy. Yeah, Peter um, mentioned this in his book, This United Nations, which is yeah. a phenomenal read. Yeah, so, so they are changing their energy um, they're, they're, they're looking to become to, to retain some sort of energy um, independence 
And so they're going to do that via coal and possibly um, bring back nuclear as well. But that's one example. There's there's many throughout Asia. There's throughout Europe, um, the US, Canada, you name it. So energy um, is is going to become um, an extraordinary extraordinary place to be investing in, um, and it's going to be across different energy sources, whether it be coal, nuclear, natural gas, all these things. And that sort of feeds into the into the agricultural space as well. Um, and do so see, I think do you see do you see any issues though like like I don't know if you saw it today, but the oil prices on the futures. Say again? The oil prices on the future market. Yeah, we were in a, a <laughs> we're in an <laughs> extraordinary situation with the contango. Um I mean, we, look, we're in a situation where oil can go to zero on the front Yeah, end. yeah. Um, and, um, and the futures traders, well, here's the issue. Someone's going to fail in this on, on delivery. They're going to need to deliver, and there won't be anywhere to deliver. Yeah. I don't know who gets screwed, whether it's the futures traders or whether it's the physical market. Um, but the the probability that we have a failure um, has just gotten much much higher. Cushing's full, like so. I mean, that comes into the the trade that we've been um, harping on about for some time now. There's tankers, and everybody's like, "Oh, shipping's going to die." And yeah, you mentioned like, that before. It's the tankers. Yeah, yeah. Well, you want you need to be super super long. Um, these guys are printing money, and no one has to work it up to the fact. But anyway, so. So that's that's just essentially, you know, you have the structure of the market and you go, okay, how do you execute on that? And and you know, you could just look and go, Oh, I could try and trade the trade the futures market in the oil, but everybody's in that trade. You need to look at second order effects. And one of those second order effects is okay, where do you store all of this excess supply? Um, and as long as the world Amir is locked down, we're not going to be burning through those supplies anytime soon. And so it's filled up strategic reserves in the US. It's it's filled up almost all the land storage and um, and now it's going on to tankers. And those tanker owners can charge pretty much whatever they, they damn well please. The other side of that, which is which is a wonderful setup, is that shipping in general, which includes your tankers, has come out of has been through a, a decade long bear market. The supply we were bullish on the sector before the um, before the coronavirus and before the um, the Saudi OPEC or OPEC plus um, fiasco came along, and the reason behind that was quite simple. You had IMO twenty twenty, which is a, a um, government mandated. Um, uh, ruling in that a lot of these these tankers have to be retrofitted to make them cleaner burning for fuel and so on and so forth and the need of that is it's taken a lot of supply off the market mm. both in terms of old ships which is too expensive to go and retrofit so they just scrap them and then those that actually do get retrofitted there's a backlog in terms of getting them retrofitted it's not that simple a process and it's costly and so it's it's decreased supply at the time when um, shipping had been through a long bear market and many shipyards have closed down. So even if you wanted to bring more supply on the market, go, oh, let's go build a ship. It's like, good luck with that. The other side of it is that um, financing of shipping has just gone away. It's gone yeah. away. So back in 2016, we started seeing, well, actually late 2015, but 2016, we started seeing um, many of the the companies and financial institutions that used to um, typically cover the shipping sector stopped covering them because there wasn't any money in it and their clients weren't interested. And so if you try and find someone actually, an institution today that covers shipping, and I'm not talking about... Um, I'm talking about in, from the finance side, so I'm not talking about industry. You can get clerks and you can get a number of these, groups, um, but they're industry related um, uh, in, um, companies in, in, the, in the finance, so banks, investment banks and things of that nature. You, you, you cannot find anyone who's even covering the space. 
those that do cover it often cover it as a slightly broader you know um market where they're covering a whole lot of things and they kind of drop a little bit of shipping in there but but no one's covering the space no one wants to finance it um shipyards have gone away supply has been destroyed and now we have this hit where they can't store the oil there's mm. nowhere to put it. so they're sticking it on tankers and so you know your 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 clean calls of the world can go out there sell the backdated month buy the short all they got to do is, is stick it on, on a ship and so they're doing that um and and so the side effect is that these tankers are going to be printing money um and so we're pretty long on that but that's i guess it's sort of a um it's it's a trade more than a long-term investment right it's going to last for a while um these guys are going to make extraordinary amounts of money the algos will find them capital will shift um they'll start trading it at multiples um and we'll get out but um on a longer term time frame um when you print the kind of money that's that's going to be printed and i don't mean qe qe was really just increasing bank reserves they're going to have to monetize debt because the yeah. extraordinary amount of the hole that they have dug in the economy um the, the cries to bailing people out are going to just be extraordinary and if they don't there'll be a threat of um serious threat of social upheaval and, and unrest and so they're going to do that um the probability is that they're going to they're going to try and bail out um multiple sectors and they're going to um, you talked about ubi something of that nature and again if you create a unit of anything and you don't tie it to productivity you're not creating anything so that's going to be inflationary you, you couple all of that inflationary impulse with the supply destruction that we're seeing um and i think we're going to see um extraordinary inflation in things that we haven't seen for over a decade mm. it'll be sectors like um copper it'll be sectors like agriculture we talked about and there's different agriculture is a little bit difficult because the, to to execute on that particular trade isn't as simple as people think unless you want to go and trade futures contracts and and we don't do that um it's it's not um we we like to we like to put our bets on things that we can bide our time basically relax sit back and let the train just take take us where we need to be and not have to worry about um getting margin calls um volatility um how are you making these up? investments though are these investments into private companies directly like what kind of financial instruments are you using to get exposure exposure to this it depends in most instances amir we're looking for equities equities okay in most instances um prefer never to take leverage and if you're buying something with a deep enough value you don't need leverage mm. um if you took if you take um if you take another sector that we're in we're talking about energy so we talk about uranium okay so in the uranium market um you go back to the peak and um from peak to i won't say trough because you never really know where the bottom is until you've come out of it and you're well out the other side but peak to where we are today over 90 percent of the companies that did exist in in what was the then etf which is called ura which we don't trade it it's a piece of garbage now but um because they've changed the structure of it but just as a as an indicator of of um value destruction you had roughly 90 percent of those companies went away the balance that were that were left standing um naturally now own more of that market share even though that that has all the entire sector has collapsed in that process very often um and this happens in many sectors you have bankruptcies so your debt holders become equity holders through restructurings and so you actually land up with companies that own more market share at the bottom have 
low or no debt levels, right? Because they got written down. Mm -hmm. um, and trade for ridiculous, ridiculous valuations. The downside, or I would say it's potentially upside, it depends on how you view these things, is that your liquidity in them is is much lower, right? Because you don't have many market participants. Anybody that invested in them for the last 10 years has been burned. And so they don't want to put their hand back into the fire. Mm. And, so, and so your number of participants in the market naturally declines, which increases volatility, right? And so this is where people get scared because they'll go and they'll buy, you know, one of these companies, they might think it's a good value. And it is, it could be trading at half book or whatever. They'll buy it and then a week later it's down 20 percent and they go oh jesus but if you you know if you know what you're buying and why you're buying it then you you don't get afraid of of those sorts of moves and you understand that all that you're, you're looking at is increased volatility as a consequence of the lack of liquidity in mm. that particular equity so to answer your question Typically, we look at equities because equities at the bottom of cycles land up working like long dated, like leaps, long dated options, They're like a long call on, on a particular sector. Um, and if you, all you need to do is find a company trading at a ridiculous value that will survive. So if it doesn't have much debt or it's got termed out debt and it's, it's, you know, got enough cash in the balance sheet, blah, 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 whatever, use all little metrics. Anyone can go and educate themselves and look at that. You find those companies and you know that over the next, say, 10 years, they will survive. Then you've, you've covered your downside. And do you care if it's gone down 20% or 30% in a month's time? Well, you'd look and go, fuck, I wish I'd bought it a bit lower, but you're never going to pick the bottom. And anyone who says that they can and do is full of shit. It's just, I mean, you know, so, so you buy things when they're super cheap and valuable. Um, and, and then you wait for that trend to, to run and take you much higher. And then they will typically you look when you look to get out, it's when everybody's interested in these things and you'll start seeing, um, Analysts come in, you'll start seeing the banks setting up departments that cover shipping or energy or whatever, right? Um, and normally at the tail end of that is what, when you find the investment banks package up um, products and productize those entire industries and they sell it to, the, to retail. That's what happens. Um, and retail is your, your last bag holder. And so yeah. when you see that sort of stuff taking place, that's when you get out and you you know. I mean, it doesn't often you get out just if the value has been has gotten to the point where it's um, it's it's too extreme. And we we almost always get out way too soon um, because we can't get scared. <laughs> we, you know, and I mean, look, I'll give you a good example. All right, I built a venture capital firm because I, I could see where where the risk capital was going to back in 2009, 10. Um, we'd just come out of the 08 crisis and, and I looked at, at what was taking place in a global market and I was like, we're, we're just going to, people are going to get forced down the risk curve because central banks are just going to keep doing what they're doing. Um, and there's going to be a, um, an absolute dearth of, of, real investment opportunities on the yield side. Mm. So you will have yield hunting, which we've seen, which is why corporate bonds got silly. Um, but the furthest end of that risk spectrum is venture capital. So I was like, that's where I need to be. And so, and so, and then we saw what happened with venture capital. And in 2015, I looked at this and I thought, this is getting really silly. This doesn't make sense. And so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not, I don't want to put, because I was putting my own capital into it as mm. well as investing capital. And I'm like, if I'm not prepared to put this in, then my investors shouldn't, like, I, I don't want to be behind um, putting other people's money to work, let alone my money. And so I've always tied my investments with the businesses that I've built. So I was like, I want to be out of this. Um, and that was, that was 2015, 2016, I sold the business, March of 2016. 
and and it lasted what another two two and a half years um just and got really silly i mean we work was the was the was you know one that people talk about a lot but there's been plenty like it um and and so you know you go through these these cycles it'll get really silly and i don't pretend to know when when you should get out i just know when things are overvalued and undervalued um so are you doing any exposure in the crypto space like do you have anything for bitcoin that you're doing yeah we do um look the way i look at bitcoin is is quite different to the way i look at, at almost every other sector that we're that we're invested in because it's not something we can look at and go okay that represents deep value it's not a deep value play it's more of a technology play but when i look at the geopolitical framework of what we have um i think it has extraordinary potential um in that it is a it's an asset class which we don't require or it's an asset class which doesn't have a counterparty that's extraordinary mm -hmm. every other asset class we have to worry about the counterparty um with bitcoin you don't it's and so people call it digital gold and i think that kind of it does make some sense um gold you own because it's a you don't have the counterparty risk you can buy it you buy your kruger hands or whatever put it in the drawer it's yours but if you ever want to transport it it's very difficult to transport um try getting on a plane with uh half a million dollars of gold coins i'm gonna i'm gonna fly mm -hmm. and so so that's difficulty in that respect whereas bitcoin doesn't it offers you an alternative map, right? and all we need to do is look at any of these countries which have had um capital controls placed zimbabwe venezuela etc and the stories that come out of it we literally the 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 best asset to own and not because it was going to go up in value was bitcoin but because the utility value of it in a in a world that we live in today was just extraordinary and so i think in this environment it's i think it's a must own it's really just depends on your own risk profile and how much how you risk weight that particular allocation um so it's it's a unique and, and i do think that we're going to have the digital currencies are, are going to come um out of this this mess in in terms of um on a global space whether bitcoin is included in that or not i don't know i do think there's a there's a I do think there's a a non-zero risk that governments ban it, and that's I think the biggest risk to it, um, and and that's why you would want to like risk weight it accordingly. I wouldn't be going and putting fifty percent of my capital or anything like that into it, um, but it it offers ex extraordinary utility value, and and it's a deflationary asset class um in in this kind of environment i could easily see it going hundred thousand in the next two years yeah. i mean people look at that and they go oh that's crazy well it's way way easier for it to do that than than what it did which was it went from a few cents to twenty thousand. right um that big move is we're not going to get anything like that again um that was was extraordinary so um yeah so that's my views on on bitcoin so you mentioned uh, the energy which is obviously tied to the food supply agriculture uh localized energy uh we're going back into more or less localism as opposed to globalism um besides the energy and bitcoin is there any other uh categories or industries that you're focusing on currently yeah i mean look we've got half a dozen um that we have built a a portfolio around um and the idea is that you want to have deep value plays a number of them that have the potential first that, that firstly shouldn't or wouldn't go away so your risk side is 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 has a certain floor to it now when i say that it doesn't mean 
that you couldn't buy something and it doesn't drop by 20, 30%. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but over time, it, it can't go away. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It's fundamental to, to civilization and to the functioning of, of our world. Um, and, and you build a basket of these different things where, where you've got your risk taken care of and then your upside is, is relatively, uh, sometimes it's, it's quite good and sometimes it's really, really good. Most of what we have is, is fits into that bucket. There are a few plays that are shorter term in nature. The tank, as we talk about, the US dollar, we're very bullish on the dollar um, for the shortish term. But that's more of a structural issue with respect to what's going on in the world. Um, and the fact that we're in a credit contraction um, and in a credit contraction, when you have the world's reserve currency as the dollar, which it is, um, there's a, a, a need for dollars. And we'll have to see how that plays out. The Fed's been opening swap lines and doing all sorts of um, gymnastics in order to alleviate that stress. Um, indications are that some of that's working. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, we'll, we don't, we just, you, at this point in time, we don't want to be short the dollar. That's for sure. So we're actually got quite a long exposure on the dollar, um, and part of that also ties into what's happening in Europe and the and because the dollar index is roughly half of it is the, is is the euro, and so people forget to look at what's going on in the US and go, oh well they're doing this and they're doing that and the dollar's going to die and all and I and I look at them like yeah so why are you so bearish to euro and they're like what, <laughs> but that's the reality of it. So. So there's you need to look at things in context, um, and and so the Europe Europe in general is in an enormous pickle. We're literally seeing the breakup of of the EU right now. Um, consider that I mean, Brexit was all about taking back sovereignty of borders. Guess what's just happened? The mm-hmm. virus came along. The EU didn't step in and say, "Oh, we're closing the border between Italy and, uh, and Spain and between." Switzerland and no, 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 no. Each of those countries individually said we're closing our borders, and that and that just exposes the flaw in logic that that was the European Union. European Union is a joke, man. It's a cartel. It's like follow our economic policies. So my whole family's in Europe, and um, it's funny. I had my honeymoon there two years ago. I went everywhere. And just for shits and giggles, I like to talk to local entrepreneurs, small business owners, and talking about their story. So we went to, yeah, it was all EU countries. Yeah. And uh, I haven't met one small business owner in any EU country that likes the European Union. Not one. Yeah. It's ridiculous. The the economic cartel of Brussels is just insane. These, these are countries and um, tribes, if you will, that have spent thousands of years fighting with each other. Mm-hmm. Thousands. Of, look, the, the um, open trade, I think, was a good idea. Mm-hmm. The European currency was a terrible idea. Terrible, because yeah. Because it, it, it inflicted on those trading nations. Um, uh, well, it pulled their... A, a, it destroyed their own sovereignty, destroyed their own sovereignty, and it made them all um, slaves of, of Brussels. Um, and if you can't control your own monetary policy, then you can't control your own politics, you can't control anything. And that's essentially what the EU wanted, um, or the, the pointy shoes in Brussels wanted. But it's destroyed um, the economies. I mean, look, these guys have been going at it for over a decade where it's been really, really troublesome. Economic growth has been lackluster. Um, it's, it's, it's reached a situation where the unemployment rates in these countries are mirroring those in sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, and it's all being kept afloat by a, um, by debt, more and more debt that has been issued by the ECB, which has been their, their, their tool to keep um, to keep the European nations um, tied into the system. Um, it's a little bit like feeding a dog and then 
whipping him, you know, and he'll keep coming back to you because he's starving. Mm. But he, he, you know, you give him another option and he's going to be out of there or he's going to turn around and he's going to fucking bite your head off at some point. Um, and that's really what it looks like. So this, you know, the, the if there's if there is something good to come out of the um, the virus issue, it is that it will almost certainly break that um, terribly despotic type of structure. One hopes that it, that what we get out of it on the other side is much um, much more freedom loving, but we don't know that. So um, there there are risks there. I think it's going to break apart. Like I, I st- if you look at the, especially with the tide, what the e, what the euro did to the lira, man, they decimated the economy of Italy, decimated it. Well, it's it's across, it's Greece, it's Italy, um, yeah, it's Portugal, it's Spain, yeah, yeah. No, look, it's um, it's, and the beneficiary behind it has largely been been Germany. And look, I mean, the only way they can actually do this is to create, um, is to um, is to pool their debts. You can't have pooled currency without pooled um, debt. Mm. And, and that's what they tried to do. And it's created these enormous tensions and these disparities across the Eurozone. And so you can't, you know, that's that's now showing the flaw. So, um, but the problem is that if you're going to federalize that debt, if you will, across a federal Europe, um, the loser is going to be Germany. Yeah. And I don't see them taking that hit. If they do, um, I suspect that we will have, um, we will have a new power in Germany that gets elected. And then that new power will go and change that structure. Um, but so, then, the, then there's so, the outlier of the UK though. It's interesting what they want to, what kind of power play they want to play in Europe then too. Well, the UK did the right thing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you see a sinking ship, you get off. Um, many people disagree with that, but that's the reality. Again, um, they gave up access to markets and so on and so forth. Um, but you were, you were, you were tied into a sinking ship. Um, and, and so they did the right thing um, on a relative basis. They they're in a better position. They will be in a better position um, than any of the other European um, countries. And what you're likely to see is on an individual basis, it'll start fragmenting. And some of these countries will say, you know what, we're just going to go and do a deal with with Britain. Yeah, the help with these. And so we want your your beef or whatever it is, and we'll sell you our bananas and, you know, and they'll do some sort of trade deals, which will be um, in contravention of the EU rules. But look, they're already, con- they are already breaking those rules right now by them setting up borders and locking down their borders. They broke them and nobody, they didn't even stop to think whether that was going to be um, uh okay with brussels or anything like that they just went no we are mm-hmm. we're close to our borders we're doing this now and they went in their head and they did it and and at the end of the day unless you have unless you have the ability both the ability and the determination to stop um, someone doing something then it doesn't matter what laws you put in place and so the european union is it doesn't there is no common army so how, how are you going to stop Austria shutting their borders? Mm-hmm. You can go and wag your finger at them and you can punish them, excuse me, with sanctions or you could penalize them in the banking system and withdraw liquidity. You could do a whole lot of things, but at the end of the day, if they decide we're doing this, they're doing that, you can't, it's it's more difficult than in, a, um, than in say, the United States or in Canada to actually um, that and so we're already seeing that taking place so i anticipate that we'll see more of that um because that it's like the system's cracked and say cracks open you can just keep pulling it open and we're going to see more and more of that so so britain on a relative basis is going to be better off than um than many of the european countries yeah i think we'll leave it at that man we covered a lot chris i just want to thank you so much for coming on again and uh, sharing your insights i know before we got on this call 
you wanted to share uh, a special uh, package uh, with my audience. And can you go ahead and kind of share exactly, uh, I know because you have like an insider newsletter that you guys offer to uh, people who are more interested. Yeah, so the, the newsletter that we have is essentially the research work that we do for our institutional and high net worth clients um, and, and managed capital. And so we take a lot of that research and we publish it to family offices and hedge funds and all the way down to retail, Joey, who, who's trying to navigate these markets. Um, and so that's called, we call that Insider. And, um, and it includes a lot of reports that we put out, special um, reports. It's, it's, look, it's, I think it's fair to say, um, and this is almost like a warning, it's not, it's not like a typical newsletter. You know, people shouldn't sign up and think, oh, we're going to get um, a monthly newsletter at the end of the month. We're going to get told what stock to buy or sell. <laughs> That's not what it is um, because I don't know any professional money manager who manages their money like that. It's absurd. I know that the publishing industry works like that and people get excited about some stock and whatever. Like what we do is we manage a portfolio with a, with a number of different ideas. We, we show people how to build a portfolio, how to position size for risk and how to asset allocate. Um, and then we manage that portfolio and we give constant updates around the particular equities and sectors and everything else as to when to get in, when to get out, when to reposition and so on and so forth. Um, and that's it's how we manage our capital. That's how we manage clients' capital. And so we, it's really just an extrapolation of that. Um, and so that's a, we, we have um, a weekly publication we put out, which is just updating on the various things that are going on. Then there's special reports. There's a massive archive of material I run a week, a monthly um, Q and A where clients can uh, ask me their questions, and we cover all of those questions in a webinar. And then we've got a community of um, of these investors that all converse with each other um, in in a Slack channel. Um, that's kind of the crux of of what that service is. Um, so it's um, yeah, that's that's what it is. Um, we've just recently. You know, we've had a lot of, we've had an extraordinary amount of interest in what, um, in what we're doing and a lot of it from institutions and then retail as well. Um, basically the things that we've been talking about for two, three years, um, people are looking at now going, whoa, okay, you guys were spot on with a lot of this and, and we're quite interested in, in knowing more. Um, and so we recently opened, opened up membership again and um and we're running a discount on that so um uh i think lucas sent you through some details on that too yeah so if anybody's interested uh chris has offered a special discount for anybody listening and watching this so if you're watching this there's a link in the description box also if you're on youtube it's in on the pinned comment if you're listening to this you just head over then to uh, youtube uh, and just look at the latest video, which is this. I will also be sending this on my email. So if you're on my email newsletter, if you're not, just go to amirosic.com. But I highly recommend it. Like you, I've had Chris on twice, guys. Like he knows this stuff. He's not even just, he's, the thing what I like about Chris is he he's not coming in from just from an investor mindset. He's coming in from an entrepreneur mindset as well. He's built businesses. He understands what it takes to build businesses. And he looks at the whole picture as opposed to the micro. He looks at looks at the macro, looks at the geopolitics, looks at the global perspective as opposed to just looking at one piece of data. You got to put all the piece of data together. So I definitely recommend everybody go check it out. Just take a look. And, uh, you know, especially in these days, you need a, you need a, a, a greater a greater scope of, of information as opposed to a very small sliver of information that you find on Twitter. Thanks, Amir. You make me sound in, make me sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, always a pleasure, brother. Talk to you again. Awesome. Take care, mate.